Brilliant. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for inviting me here today. My name is Pete Johnson, um, and I'm best known for first of all writing funny books. Who likes funny books? Who enjoys funny books? Yeah, lots of hands, loads of hands. Over there, brilliant, fantastic. Um, and I wrote one book called How to Train Your Parents. How many people here have got parents a little bit bossy sometimes? Just tell me sickly, no one's watching. And oh, every hand, every hand there as well, fantastic. Well, <clears throat> guess what? In How to Train Your Parents, you find a secret way to stop your parents being bossy, and you learn the four ways to train them. And the main character is Louis, a boy who wants to be discovered as a comedian. Guess what? How to Train Your Parents became a bestseller, not only in this country, but in 30 other countries too, including, just show you a few of them, this is the, the French cover of How to Train Your Parents, it looks like that. Um, we've also got the Chinese cover of How to Train Your Parents, which looks like that. And we've got the Japanese cover of How to Train Your Parents. And the latest country um, to publish How to Train Your Parents is Iran, and that's the Iranian version of How to Train Your Parents. Gone literally all over the world. And the main character, Louis, became so popular, people said, you must bring him back, and I have. And the latest book to feature Louis is my most talked about book called How to Update Your Parents. What would you do if your parents said, we're gonna have a ban on all laptops, all computers, all iPhones, nothing for a whole week? Who'd be horrified? Who'd be horrified? Who'd be horrified? Yeah, yes, everyone would be horrified. Brilliant. What can Louis do? Lots about this book on my website, PeteJohnsonAuthor.com. As well as comedies, I'm famous for writing award-winning thrillers uh, like Traitor and Avenger, famous anti-bullying sort of stories as well, and some of the most popular books in schools. And I'm also famous for writing horror stories. Who likes horror stories? Scary stories, yes, wow. I love <clears throat> writing horror stories. And I'm gonna tell you today about one horror story that changed my whole life. It's called The Ghost Dog. Now, it wasn't my first book. I'd written five books before this, and they all sold quite well. They sold, you know, okay. But then this book came along and it changed my whole life. It became a bestseller, it won two prizes, it won the Saturday morning television, and it's a scary story, and it starts like this. The first time I only saw its face. Out of the darkness, it came floating towards me. It had evil red eyes. Blood poured out of its mouth. It was the ugliest, most horrible thing I'd ever seen and I'd brought it to life. I thought that in mad science and stories we create monsters, not 10-year-old boys like me, Daniel Grant. This is a fantasy story with a difference. Most books you probably read, fantasy stories, are about superpowers you might like to have, but you haven't got. But in this horror story, Daniel discovers he's got a superpower, but I've got you've got, and everyone in all the schools watching have got, and that is the power of our imagination. And you will see how imagination is the special secret power that we all have, the superpower, and how it creates a monster. Now, when you're writing a horror story, the most important thing, first of all, is to have characters who you like and believe in and follow their story. Why? Why not just write lots of scary stuff? Well, I'll tell you. Um, could I have a volunteer, please? Someone who's quite, who's good at acting. Someone who's good at acting. Someone who's good at acting. Okay, do you wanna come and join me? Come to the front, please. Round of applause, thank you very much. Thank you very much. <coughs> right, now, what's your name? Bartek. Sorry? Bartek. Bartek, now, here's the thing. You're known and loved 
around the world, aren't you? But in this school. Now, if I said to you, a boy saw a ghost last night, how scary is that on a scale of one is scary, ten not scary at all? How scary is that? One, two, three, ten. Ten, really? A boy saw a ghost. I think I could make it scarier. Now we've got, I want you, can you go down those stairs again? And I want you to come up those stairs, and I want you to, and imagine I'm a very strict teacher, all right? And I want you to say, I'm sorry, Mr. Snodgrass, I'm very late because I've just seen a ghost, and I want you to make it really scary, okay, right? So I'm being Mr. Snodgrass, right, class, right, come on, go on with your work, there's someone who's not, there's someone who's not here, someone who's missing, oh, here he is now. How scary is that? How could you make it even scarier? How could you make it even scarier? Yes? More description. Can you give us a bit more description? Uh, what do you mean, boy, you saw a ghost? What do you mean you saw a ghost? I saw a bloody fleshy vampire. How scary now? Yeah. Eight? Yeah. Bit more detail still? What, and what was it? Ten? Oh, you got a ten already? Yes, bit more? Big round of applause. You were off. We're off. We're away. <laughs> round of applause. That's for you. It's a prize. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now, once you bring the two things there, three things to write a really good sp spooky story. One is believability. You've got to believe it. Secondly, as you did brilliantly there, it's detail. You've got to have detail in that story. And thirdly, it's got to be the character. Characters we care about. <laughs> now we've got the story, the conflict. Now, no, every story has to have conflict. Conflict moves the story ahead. So what, what is our first conflict? What's the first conflict in the, in the story? What, what, is the, what, what is our essential conflict in that story of the ghost dog? What was the conflict there? Bef what was, yeah. Yeah, you've got Daniel and Aaron. And by the way, it gets worse. Soon, Daniel can't stand having Aaron in his house. He wants Aaron out. And then comes the day of the spooky party. Now, someone said that Aaron is, is a big head. Who thinks he's a big head? Yeah? He's a big head. Yeah, he thinks he's a big head. Yeah, he thinks he's a big head. So they decide they're going to play a trick on Aaron. They're going to have the spooky party a bit later. And they're going to really try and scare Aaron and put Aaron in his place. So here's our big... So here we come together, the characters and the basic thing of the whole story. They're going to try and scare Aaron and put him in his place. Now, I think that makes what happens next, hopefully, all the more exciting and interesting, because you've got the conflict with Daniel and Aaron, and you've also got the beginnings of the fantasy part of the story of the ghost dog. Even I feel a bit embarrassed for Aaron at that moment. Nothing worse than a parent who has to force you into things. I think Laura was a bit sorry for Aaron too. He said quite gently to him, would you like to have a go at telling a ghost story now, Aaron? Aaron didn't answer a moment. He said in this really sneery voice, I stopped telling ghost stories years ago. They never scare me anyway. <clears throat> I was so angry, I couldn't speak at first. Why did Aaron have to act as if he was way above us? He ruined everything. Then Harry shouted across at me, there's one ghost story which scares everyone. Isn't it, Dan? A true one, too. I hadn't a clue what Harry was talking about. Went along with him. Oh, yeah, that's a terrible story. But not to Aaron, that one. I give him nightmares. Aaron gave a mocking laugh. Will you tell Aaron the story? Oh, shall I? asked Harry. I will, I said. This is a true story of... of... the ghost dog. And I said those words. My heart began to beat excitedly. I switched off the torch. The whole place was in darkness. A picture was forming at the back of my head. As it became clearer, I had this strange power building up inside me. This is an old local legend, I began, my voice shaking slightly with excitement. Now this boy who lived with his parents and they were quite poor. That night, the boy goes downstairs to get some biscuits when he finds a dead dog in his basement. Oh, that's sad, murmured Laura, but suddenly the dog springs to life. 
and it's the biggest dog the boy has ever seen, an Irish wolfhound. But he tells the boy not to be afraid and says, you do me a favour, I'll do you one. Make me a grave where I can rest. If you do that, I'll give you a hundred pounds. The boy's eyes open wide, he's got a hundred pounds. And he asks the money right away. All right, I'll trust you the dog. And he gets the boy to follow him. They walk the deepest part of the, of the old churchyard and the dog asks the boy to take a left a large stone up. The boy does so. Neath the stone are ten ten-pound notes. The boy stares hard at the money in amazement. Has so much money in his life before. The man goes to the fairy, cries. Bet you're part of the bargain, the dog calls after him. I'll be back tonight to make your grave, I promise, cries the boy. I'll be here, says the dog. A little sigh, he sits down and waits and waits. But it's a good time with his mate, forgets all about the ghost dog. Later that night, the boy hears strange scratching noises in his bedroom. And then he sees a pair of red eyes staring at him. It is the dog. You broke your promise to me, he says. Now I shall make sure you never forget me. I'm going to haunt your dreams the rest of your life. Well, the dig dog did. Every night when the boy closed his eyes, the dog was waiting for him. And each night the dog became more mocked and terrifying until one morning he found his parents, the par his parents found the boy dead in his bed. <coughs> Look of terror, frozen on his face. He was actually frightened to death by the ghost dog. I paused. Now, sorry, it seemed so real to me, also have in it, even shuddering at the end. But had it scared Aaron all at once? There was loud, mocking laughter. What a load of old rubbish, said Aaron. It's not rubbish, I replied fiercely. It's real. And Harry said, come on, Danny. Now, I'm finished around the rest of the story, have you? You tell me the rest, and I replied, wondering what Harry was up to. Well, said Harry, the end of the story is this. The dog has to go off and make his own grave. It digs a hole, and it carries some stones to cover up the grave. And even at the road by the old church, because I'd be too scared to even move a stone and take one away, especially because of the creeps. But you wouldn't be scared, would you, Aaron? She added slyly, so why don't you move a stone away? What now, whispered Aaron, suddenly his voice would have shrunk. Yes, why not now, I said. Go on, I dare you. So do I, joined Harry. All three of us stared at him expectantly. What do you think happens next? What do you think? Yes. They're going to go there to the churchyard. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Brilliant. Okay. Anyone else? What do you think? Anyone else? What do you think happens next? Anyone else? What do you think? What do you think could happen next? Yes. Going to get a nightmare. We'll come back to that. Yes. Very good. Very good. Yes. Who thinks Aaron does pick up the stone? Who thinks he doesn't? Who'd like to know what happens next? Yes, I'll tell you. They go to the churchyard. Uh, Daniel, Laura and Harry. Aaron's there, all sort of confident. I'm going to move that stone. He's going to pick up the stone. He almost has it in his hands. So suddenly, out of nowhere, this dog starts to howl. A long, low, mournful sound. You can tell by kind of warning. Aaron loses nerve. He's going to pick up that stone. But Daniel picked it up and Laura, and Harry, laughing, <coughs> making fun of them. But that night, something happens. Daniel wakes up shaking, and so does Laura, so does Harry. The ghost dog is there in all their dreams. And the next night, it's there again. And they know when they close their eyes tonight, the ghost dog will be there, waiting. They created this monster. How now can they get rid of it? Can they get rid of it? Read on if you dare. Who dares to read on? Who dares to read more? Right, fantastic, fantastic. Anyone who, yes, brilliant, fantastic. And it's a very spooky story. But it's also a story about friendship. And it's about Daniel, Laura, and Harry. And it's about Aaron. Now, I'm going to ask you to do something quite hard now, quite difficult. Aaron is the antagonist in the story, isn't he? He's the one who caused this in the first place. They made the story to try and scare him, and they're kind of a, a creature they can't control. But does anyone think we've been a bit too hard on Aaron? Anyone here think they could give Aaron's point of view? Aaron, see, anyone give us, anyone think you could? Come and join me, yes, please. Come and join me, yes, please. Thank, round of applause. Thank you very much. Do you come and join me? Thank you very much. Thank you. Big round of applause. Now, now up to now, 
We've heard that Aaron is a big head, he's a show off, he's horrible, he ruined the ghost storytelling evening, and so on. Could you come and stand here, please? Thank you very much. Now, you're going to be rather brilliantly. Give us the other side. He's our antagonist, but is there a, is there a, what would you say in defense of Aaron? Or could you, what, would you, what could you say in defense of Aaron? Too hard on him, yeah. And I think maybe the reason that he's such a big head is because he's so small for his age. Yes. And he wants to stand up for himself, but he's standing up for himself in the wrong way, and he's become a big nasty pants. Big nasty pants, yes. So you think Aaron is actually putting up a bit of an act, really, yes. Also, of course, his mother's dead, isn't he? He's on his own in the, in the house. D did you feel a little bit sorry for him or not? What, what, what do you think? I did actually feel you did. sorry for yeah, him. Yeah, it, it, and... Do you think when they tried to scare him, was that a, a, a horrible thing to do or a good thing to do? Or what, what, what do you think? Well, it's a horrible thing to do. What, why is that? It's not necessarily his fault that he's like this. Yes. So you, you, you think that. That's brilliant. Big round of applause. Big round of applause. Thank you very much. Thank you. So that's our answer as for you. Thank you very much. Big round. Thank you very much. Now, that's a thing in a story. You're seeing it from Daniel's point of view. The book is told in the first person. What's the first person? What is that? What's the first person? What is that? Yes. Yeah, so you get Daniel's voice from the start telling you. But what I hope is, <clears throat> you might think, well, maybe Aaron isn't quite as bad as Daniel says, or is he? Who thinks Aaron is pretty bad? Who thinks Aaron is pretty awful? Yeah, okay, right, I love you. Okay, well, that'd be interesting what you think and what you decide there. But the thing is, you've got the conflict... In the story at the end, you've got Aaron. Daniel wants to get rid of Aaron. He wants Aaron out of his bedroom and out of his life. They have a big argument. And, of course, he needs also to sort out the ghost dog. He's conjured up this story. What I haven't told you about the ghost dog is Aaron and Daniel have a big argument. Now, I'll tell you a secret about me. In real life, I hate arguments. Who here hates arguments? Who hates arguments? Yeah. I will do anything to avoid an argument. But I quite enjoy writing arguments. Anyone here quite like writing arguments? Yeah. So when you've got two characters, your protagonist Daniel and your antagonist um, Aaron, you're bringing things in a way to the boil, to the climax there, where things really get bad. In a story, things have to build and build and build. And so we've already seen how Daniel and Aaron don't get on. Why don't Daniel and Aaron get on? Why don't they get on? Well, yes. Yeah, brilliant. He thinks Aaron's a big show off. He's there in his room. He, he ruined the spooky story evening. But then don't forget this. Aaron was going to show off and take that stone, and then he dropped the stone at the last minute. Why? What, why did Aaron drop the stone? Why did Aaron drop the stone at the last minute? What, what made him drop the stone? Yes. Yeah, he got scared, didn't he? He got scared. Aaron got scared. Now, you don't like Aaron. Imagine you're Daniel, and he got scared. Are you going to never mention it again, or are you going to mention it every two minutes? What do you think you might do? What do you think? Aaron got scared. What do you think you might do? Yes. Yeah, what do you think? Yeah. Every few minutes. And what they do is <clears throat> they bring the stone back. <clears throat> Showing off, bring the stone back that Aaron wouldn't dare to pick up. Is that a bit mean? Or is it, would you, who would do that as well? Who would do that as well? Who would bring the stone back? Would you, hands up, who would bring the stone back? Yes? Would you be lucky? You, I would as well. So they bring the stone back. They're going to try and play a joke on Aaron. Laura is going to take, is going to hold the stone and pretend she got all scared. But in fact, Laura actually sees the ghost dog. Yes, she does. She's scared out of her wits by the ghost dog. And, and Daniel is a really good friend to her and helps her. And then Daniel goes into his bedroom and he holds this stone up. Has it really got some magic powers? Have they put some powers on it through imagination? He can't work it out. And he's not 
holding the stone to annoy Aaron at that moment. But here's what happens next. I took one last look at the stone. It fascinated me. It was so jagged and heavy. It's a bit like one of those uh, stones from the old, old times. Maybe it'd been. Stones can be thousands of years old. Just thinking about that, when I heard a loud sighing behind me. Aaron was glaring at me. What's the matter with you? Aaron shook his head. You're pathetic. What are you going on about? Demanded. You and that stone. You think you're so funny, don't you? I was just looking at it. Yeah, yeah. I know what you were doing. That stone, you couldn't just have got rid of it, any normal person, could you? No, you've got to bring it here in the bedroom. What's you anyway, I said. Unless this stone scares you. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's such a scary stone, isn't it? Well, you were afraid to take it home. No, I wasn't. Yes, you were. Your hand was shaking when you held that stone. Yeah, it was shaking with laughter. You liar, I cried. Aaron's voice began to rise. Do you think I believe that stupid story you told me? You believed every word, and you dropped that stone because you were scared out of your wits. I was not. Aaron was practically screaming at me now. Scared out of your wits, I repeated. My bedroom door flew open, and Mum and Dad, Mum and Roy, were standing there. We were just discussing something, I mumbled. We were making far too much noise, began Mum. Then all at once, Roy exploded beside her. I don't know what's going on in here. You've got this nice big room with plenty of space for two people, so what's the big problem? What is the problem? Roy stopped for breath. His mouth had gone down at the corners and his eyes were bulging at me. Roy obviously decided I was the main culprit here. I think you've both behaved badly, cut in mum. Perhaps to stop Roy going on with his very biased view of what had happened. And I think uh, you, you both better go to sleep. The sooner you go to sleep, the better. She half pushed Roy out of the bedroom. He looked as if he had a bit more to say, all against me, no doubt. I lay in my, bed, my bunk stunned. I'd quite liked Roy before, but tonight he'd shown himself in his true colours. Whatever happened, it would always be me in the wrong, never his precious son. I glared down at Aaron. Been crying to your daddy, have you? I wouldn't waste a second talking about you, snapped Aaron. I was shaking with anger now. I didn't want him in this house, in my bedroom. He was ruining everything. In the end, I was shaking so much I had to get up. I let Rocky out. He kind of wanted to be stroked. I just sat on the floor, stroking him and whispering, one day we'll have this room to ourselves. Because books are dead until they're read. Until you pick up and read the book, this book doesn't come alive. But when you read it, something quite magical happens. Has anyone here ever read a book and then watched a film and thought, that's not how I saw it, that's not how it was, yes, yes. Well, that's what happens a lot because when you read a book, it's a partnership between you and the author. You're doing some of the work, you're picturing it in your mind and that's why no TV, no TV show or film can match what you saw. That imagination that we all have really is a superpower and that's what the ghost dog is also all about.